Hello, my name is Matt Spurnow, and I'm the Director of the Conflict, Security and Development Research Group at King's College London. On the occasion of the International Day for Mine Awareness and Assistance in Mine Action on the 4th of April, we decided to organize a special seminar looking at the history, evolution and achievements of the Mine Action Programme in Afghanistan. We invited four distinguished panelists and I'd like briefly to introduce them to you. Our first speaker is Martin Barber, who is a former director of the United Nations Mine Action Program. And he is also a author of Blinded by Humanity, a story of the inside of the UN's humanitarian operations. Our second speaker is Mr. Mohammed Shafiq Yasufi, who is the current director of the Directorate of Mine Action Coordination in Afghanistan. He has been working with you in Mine Action since 2002, and in 2013, he was appointed to his current post. Our third speaker is Ms. Sohaila Hashemi. She's a communications and advocacy officer with the United Nations Mine Action Service in Afghanistan. She graduated from the American University of Afghanistan and joined UNMAS in 2019. Last but not least, uh, we are joined by Mr. Daniel Bertoli, who is head of programs at the, at the Danish demining group in Afghanistan. Uh, since 2018, he has been leading the mine action component of the Danish Refugee Council's work in Afghanistan. Uh, I will not uh, say much more, uh, simply to welcome you all uh, I was reminded um, very firmly by Julia when we first talked about this that mine action, of course, is not just about mine clearance. Uh, mine clearance, the the surveying and mapping and 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 demining is an important component, but it's only one. Uh, the others, of course, are mine risk reduction and assistance to victims advocacy, an important advocacy role in relation to the various treaty instruments we have, and last but not least, stockpile destruction. And, and the origins of this, if you like, edifice of Mayan Action Service goes right back to Afghanistan, and that's why it's so appropriate that we, we, we mark this special event by, by looking in detail at that history. So without further ado, can I ask uh, Martin to uh, start us off by providing us with a a historical context or a historical overview, as it were, perspective on the HMA in Afghanistan. Thank you very much indeed. And um, thanks to all those who are taking part. It's really great to be back amongst uh, friends from Afghanistan. I want to take you back to the 15th of February, 1989. That was the day on which the last Soviet soldier left Afghanistan after 10 years of Soviet military presence in the country to return to the Soviet Union. At that time, there were more than 3 million Afghan refugees living in Pakistan and more than 3 million Afghan refugees living in Iran. And of course, with the departure of the Soviet troops, there was a tremendous hope and expectation that everybody would be able to return home. Um, I was then working for the UN office coordinating humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. And I was based in Pakistan. And we knew that the towns and villages to which these Afghan refugees wanted to return were heavily uh, contaminated with anti-personnel landmines. Now, there was no previous experience anywhere in the world for the UN of managing what has come to be called a mine action program. So we were starting completely from scratch and Indeed, we weren't absolutely sure that anybody would accept that mine clearance was a humanitarian task. Uh, 
many people thought that it was a military task. So we started by organizing um, training for more than 10,000 Afghan volunteers in Pakistan, refugees, um, in the basic techniques of mine clearance, locating and uh, destroying landmines. We also started some basic mine awareness courses since become mine risk education. And um, so we, we were preparing to support the return of Afghan refugees to their villages. It soon became clear that the training of Afghan volunteers was not sufficient. So we identified initially five leading Afghan personalities uh, and invited them each to manage a new Afghan NGO dedicated to one or other aspect of mine action. So we had one doing surveys, we had two doing mine clearance, we had one doing mine awareness, and we had one doing survey and, and um, sorry, uh, training and mon monitoring. And they were soon joined by another organization working with mine detecting dogs. Now, we started with two small teams of 30 men each working in the province of Kuna uh, on the border of Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. And that went quite well. And one day, a colleague came to me and said, um, Martin, look what the ICRC is saying about our program. And this was a, a press report that the International Committee of the Red Cross had said, if the UN continues going so slowly with their mine clearance program in Afghanistan, it will take 1,200 years to complete. So we, we, we were a bit, a bit shocked by this, but we soon realized that actually it was a blessing in disguise because what it meant was that the ICRC accepted that mine clearance was a humanitarian activity. And those who had said that the UN should not be doing mine clearance remained silent. And this persuaded a number of governments, donor governments, to provide funding for humanitarian mine action which they had been unwilling to do up until then. And so very quickly, the numbers uh, expanded and within two or three years, the mine action program was employing over 8,000 Afghans uh, undertaking mainly uh, mine clearance operations. Now, how was it organized? So each of these five um, Afghan NGOs, their directors were joined by our uh, United Nations Mine Action Program Manager as part of the, the, the management team of this operation. And the operation came to be known as the Mine Action Program for Afghanistan, MAPA, MAPA. And there were three key principles that were established at the outset of the MAPA. The first was that if it was going to be a humanitarian program, then it needed to conform with the humanitarian principles of impartiality and neutrality. So we established a principle that if an area was to be uh, cleared of mines, all the parties to the conflict must agree that those mines were no longer in use 
everybody must agree that those minds could be removed. Because if one side to the conflict thought that those mines were still useful to their military objectives, then if we removed them, we were effectively going to be taking part in the conflict. The second principle was that all the organizations in the mine action program must adopt the same standard operating procedures and the same terms and conditions of employment of their staff. So uh, that was developed, uh, put together and monitored within the context of the management of the program under the UN program manager. And the third was that in order to guarantee for donors that their money was being used effectively, we had very close oversight of the financial and, and administrative operations of those five Afghan NGOs. And they were regularly audited. And I have to say that uh, some years, the NGOs audit reports were better than the UN's own audit reports. Um, so what can one conclude from that? Oh, and I should just say also, uh, just briefly, that there were two other key elements from the perspective of the Afghan deminers. One was that we were able to provide insurance cover so that if a deminer was injured or lost their lives, uh, the family or the deminer would receive a payment from the insurance company. These were not huge payments, but they were very important to the affected families. And the second was that if there was an accident and a deminer was injured, the UN aircraft would always go immediately to pick them up, bring them to Peshawar, to the hospital there for the best possible treatment. And occasionally, uh, senior ambassadors were left stranded in cities in Afghanistan, had to spend an extra night because their plane was diverted. Nobody ever complained. So what can we conclude? I think we could conclude that if the three principles that I just elaborated were adopted and maintained, then donors could, with confidence, support a program implemented by local organizations, by Afghan NGOs in this case, with um, assurance that their money would be well spent. Um, what happened subsequently, of course, was that, and, and I'm not saying that this was by any means a bad thing, it was it was very beneficial in many countries. Uh, a number of new international NGOs were established to do mine action, the different aspects of mine action that Professor Badal indicated at the beginning. And of course, Western donors um, tend to prefer to put their money into their own uh, national organizations rather than support local organizations in a country like Afghanistan. So when mine action programs began in Cambodia and Mozambique and Angola, most of the operations there were managed by um, international NGOs rather than by local organizations. I should say just in conclusion that um, when we started in Afghanistan in 1990, the one international NGO that was already there had also just set up was the Halo Trust. And they maintained their operations 
they coordinated their activities with the Afghan groups and the UN program, but they maintained their independent operation in the Shomali Plain, north of Kabul and in Puli Kumri. Um, and uh, as I understand now, their operations have grown quite substantially. But for the first few years, the program was dominated by uh, Afghan uh, NGOs. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a introductory context of the mine action program in Afghanistan. Back to you, uh, Matt. Thank you so much, uh, Martin, and thank you also for sticking admirably to the uh, to the time. Let's move straight on to uh, Shafiq Yusufi, please. Uh, can I have a feedback from Yulia? Do you, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, it's perfect. I, I can see Sibylle. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the King's College London uh, Department of War Studies for inviting myself to provide some information about the uh, achievements and also the level of contamination in Afghanistan. And I'm very happy to see or to hear that the college is celebrating the 4th of April, the International Day for Mine Action. Mr. Martin Barber, he explained about the history of Mine Action Program of Afghanistan I do not want to touch too much on the history. I will talk more about the current status of a humanitarian mine action program in Afghanistan. A little bit, the history of conflict very quickly. The fighting started in Afghanistan in 1979 with the invasion of former Soviet Union troops. Before that, nobody even knew about the mines. Fighting continued. Uh, lots of area, areas in Afghanistan contaminated by landmines. And uh, after Soviet Union withdrawal, the Soviet-backed regime, they also continued fighting with Mujahideen. Again, areas contaminated. During the internal conflict in 1992, the scale of problem get bigger and bigger. During the Taliban time, there was fighting between the Taliban and Northern Alliance. Again, areas of Afghanistan contaminated by landmines and explosive remnants of war. And uh, since 2001, with the presence of international troops in Afghanistan and their fight against tourism in Afghanistan, areas are contaminated either by ERW or by homemade mines, which we call it uh, victim-operated IEDs, those types of mines that we are gathering information about. The Mine Action Program of Afghanistan, as uh, Mr. Martin also indicated, uh, established in 1989. Currently, 40 plus organizations are working in this program. Uh, some of them are non-for-profit organizations, uh, some of them are commercial demining firms. Currently, about 6,000 demining personnel are working under this program. If we compare it with uh, 2011, which the Mine Action Program of Afghanistan receiving the peak funding, uh, Nowadays, 57% reduction has uh, happened uh, with uh, the mine action manpower. This is our vision. I put this picture about uh, Afghanistan. This is a famous place in the center of Afghanistan, Bamiyan. I think there was uh, the tallest uh, Buddha statue here. Uh, 
in March 2001, uh, the Taliban, when they were ruling Afghanistan, they destroyed this uh, statue. Just the hole is left, remained uh, the statue, and some other small statues have been demolished here. Uh, this is the map which uh, showing the status of contamination, all those red dots representing a minefield, and those areas which are colored green, they are the districts which have been entirely cleared and, and uh, handed over to the beneficiaries. So the green districts are totally cleared now. Since the beginning of uh, MAPA, 114 districts and 3,140 communities cleared entirely. As a result, over 20 million different types of explosive ordnance, including landmines, explosive remnants of war, cluster munitions, and victim operated IDs have been destroyed. Parallel to demining operations, uh, rescue education have been provided to vulnerable people and their communities using different approaches, direct sessions through media or through UNHCR transitional centers. We also have some progress regarding victim assistance services provided to 400,000 400, people by MAPA. Other ministries are also providing support to victims, but this is specifically attributed to MAPA activities. Unfortunately, civilian casualties as a result of accident related to landmines and explosive remnants of war, and also victim operated IDs. This is very high in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, Afghanistan, according to the landmine monitor, has the highest number of civilian casualties globally within the countries affected by landmines and ERW. About 60% of civilian casualties are attributed to accident of victim-operated IDs. We also use the term improvised mines or anti-personal mines of improvised nature. It is roommate used by non-state actors, by the Taliban, and also by the IS. 39%, more than 39% of civilian casualties attributed to explosive remnants of war. So see that the problem of landmine in ERW is getting increased day by day. Since 2001, fighting has been continuing in Afghanistan, wherever fights happen, there are some explosive ordnance remain unexploded. So it caused a threat and also harm to civilians. Only 1% of the civilian casualties attributed to the industrial mine, which are belonging to the conflicts pre-2001. This is one picture from a family as a result of ERW accident, seven children of the same family, they have lost either two legs or one leg. This is an indication, a small example of problem in Afghanistan. The nature of contamination in Afghanistan, it is uh, challenging because there is not records of uh, mines where these, they are used most of the time, it is used by different, fact, uh, different parties. It is used randomly. Some areas are contaminated by minimum metal contents mine, which is difficult for detecting. Some areas, depth of mine is higher and also causing a challenge ahead of the mining organizations to detect and discover. It is used indiscriminately, unfortunately. Nowadays, the victim operated IEDs or the weapon of choice by anti-government elements in Afghanistan. They can, they put it everywhere. However, they are putting it against military convoy or against military personnel. 
but unintended target of such devices, level devices, sometimes it is uh, you know, civilians which are traveling from one location to another by car or by any other transportation means. The Taliban and anti-government elements, they are using different techniques. There are some pictures. Sometimes they are connecting it with, uh, with uh, batteries. Sometimes they are putting an anti-personal mine on top of a big helmet or IED. So it is always um, causing problem on, on local people. We have now different types of demining tools. We have manual demining tools, which are using detector, make, uh, mine detection dots, mechanical. In terms of risk education, as I mentioned earlier, we do risk education through direct sessions as well media and other, other means. DMAC, uh, I am the director of DMAC. DMAC is a directorate of the National Disaster Management Authority. We are the regulatory body for humanitarian mine action program in Afghanistan. What we are doing is listed here. We are actually program manager of the humanitarian mine action in Afghanistan. We also do coordination, resource mobilization, advocacy, and communication, information management. We also do quality management and planning and priority setting. So we had a plan to complete Afghanistan by 2023 based on the Article 5 of the Ottawa Convention. But due to many reasons, including a shortage of funding, insecurity, we are not going to achieve that by March 2023. We are preparing another extension request that will, we will request another seven year extension for our deadline. In total, there will be 470 square kilometer area contaminated will be left uncleared by March 2023. And we are going to continue it until 2030. We are also going to publish and the next, the new strategic mine action strategic plan. The, the strategic plan, which was uh, expired by end of March 2000, 2021. Uh, it had four strategic goals. Up, up to 90% we achieved those uh, objectives uh, with the previous strategy. The new strategy, one goal is added. We have five strategic goals, life-saving, victim assistance, Sustainable development goals, you know that uh, mine action is a prerequisite for implementation of development projects. We considered one goal, uh, how mine action can support implementation of uh, development projects at national level. Uh, gender and diversity mainstreaming, advocacy and coordination. Our areas of focus for the future we have put some of them here, some of the most important ones. Uh, in terms of capacity building, uh, previously humanitarian mine action uh, program didn't clear uh, those areas which are contaminated by victim operating IDs. It was, it was always considered that it is a military a business or it is a military task. Uh, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, they have, they also have their uh, demining units. But taking into consideration the high number of civilian casualties that we are observing, we tried to convince, we tried to advocate for engaging humanitarian demining capacity for survey and clearance of one type of IDs, which is pressure pallet ID or victim operated IDs because based on the definition of the Ottawa Convention, it is considered anti-personal mine. We are also going to do a nationwide survey to identify the scale of contamination after 2001, which mainly include 
victim operated IDs and explosive remnants of war. We will do the clearance of victim operated IDs. We are also going to, we are trying, we have already started to identify synergies, get engaged with other sectors to use their capacities for, for clearance or survey of, uh, uh, survey of areas from mines in ERW. We have been in contact with Ministerial Defense and Interior, Protocol 5 of the CCW Convention on Conventional Weapons. It obliges oblige all parties in conflict to clear explosive ordinance from the fighting zones. So if we can have the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior to effectively clear the fighting zones, there will be some support and will release some, some uh, pressure from the shoulder of the MAPA. We're also trying to identify and search for new, techno new technologies. Uh, the funding is getting declined uh, day by day. We want to cover some of those fi financial gap by introduction of new technologies that can make the work of the mining more efficient. We also have been engaged, uh, I mean, in the past, there were two times the mining, uh, the mining organizations recruited ex-combatants. So there is peace negotiation ongoing in Istanbul. There will be another peace negotiation between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan. We have submitted a project proposals there is about 30% of the Afghan territory which is contaminated by the mining teams cannot go because of insecurity. As soon as the peace is established, we hope that we can access those areas and we are hoping that some countries will fund that proposal that we have already submitted to them. There are a couple of challenges that have been always impeding delivery of mine action services ongoing conflicts, it is adding to the existing problem, areas are recontaminated or new areas are contaminated by landmines and also by ERW. In some areas, access to contaminated areas is difficult. Non-state parties demand illegal taxation from implementing partners. The big problem nowadays in Afghanistan is victim-operated IEDs. The, the anti-government elements place it anywhere they wish. A spot ERW is another problem. Sometimes children picking them, playing with them, or due to poverty, they collect piece of metals. Sometimes they do not distinguish between, between uh, dangerous and safe items. However, risk education is an ongoing process parallel to the mining. There are some pictures of uh, impact of uh, victim operated IEDs, which has went off on vehicles from supporting local people. In one accident, we remember that 34 civilians killed uh, on the way from Herat to Kandahar. So this is uh, actually a big challenge nowadays in front of us. And thank you so much. I hope I was able to stick with the time, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Shatik, for a, a, a wonderful, clear overview of the, of the challenges you are, you are still facing. Thank you so much. Um, let's move straight on to, to Sohaila and, and people will no doubt be writing down their, their questions. So, Hela. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me in this wonderful event. And uh, thank you for Mr. Martin and Mohammed Shafiq for the wonderful uh, presentation. So um, um, I'm going to start um, my pre presentation with talking about the current um, role of UN mass in Afghanistan. So let, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, 
So, as you might all know that uh, in 2018, uh, UN Mass transited and delegated all leading roles of uh, Mine Action Program of Afghanistan to uh, the DMAC, the Director of Mine Action Coordination Office. And uh, since then, um, UN Mass role is uh, mainly the technical and financial assistance to to the DMAC, as well as the implementing partners, which are the local and international um, NGOs uh, in Afghanistan in the MAPA, in order to ensure that the mine action sector in Afghanistan is coordinated effectively. Um, here I have listed um, uh, the major activities um, areas that we do, for example, the strategic planning, the advocacy activities that uh, UN must um, do, and the research mobilization and uh, technical advisory, as well as the funds management. So in order to understand uh, uh, the role of UN mass in uh, mine action program better here, um, I can show you this diagram that shows the relationship between the UN mass and um, the national director, which is DMAC. As here you can see, and here are the mutual arrows, uh, which shows uh, our mutual relationship. Uh, we assist at DMAC in terms of capacity building, uh, technical assistance in developing the annual and national strategies and uh, we do many shared advocacy works. At the same time, uh, in our activities, we need uh, the DMAC. For example, DMAC owns uh, the IMSMA, which is the data center. And you might know that in mine action, the management of data is extremely important. So, uh, and currently DMAC has the role of uh, managing the data and we receive um, our data from DMAC for our advocacy activities. And then here you see that um, DMAC uh, has the leading role on the MAPA. In the blue, this is the logo of uh, Mine Action Program of Afghanistan. And as well as on the other side, we have our relationship with the implementing partners. We support them in terms of capacity building, uh, as well as uh, some direct grants and projects to them. Um, here are some examples of our recent um, supports and activities in Afghanistan. Um, first thing is the Abundant Improvised Mine AIM uh, of Afghanistan Mine Action Strategy, which is called AIM-MS. Um, this strategy was developed in coordination with uh, GMAC um, and the technical assistant of, assistance of UN MAS in order to ensure uh, the AIM projects are coordinated effectively, effectively based on this strategy, which helps DMAC and other national authorities in prioritization and quality control of AIM areas and AIM projects. I need to mention that this standard is one of its first kinds among the other countries who have active mine action programs. The second one is the AIM clearance uh, training. Um, this training was in 2020, last year. And it is also one of its first um, training in the country. As um, you might know, the rate of AIM casualties has really increased in Afghanistan. So we really saw the need um, to organize this uh, training and build the capacity of the local organization in Mine Action Program um, to be able to survey and at the same time clear the AIM contaminations in Afghanistan. The third one, uh, the third example is the access negotiations. 
you might know that in um, mine and clearance programs, community liaison is extremely important. It is very important to be to have good relationship with the local communities of the beneficiary or the contaminated areas. Um, for this uh, purpose, um, UN Mass provided uh, specialized and well-trained access negotiation officers for the implementing partners or the local organizations who do the clearance projects in the field. We also pro provide updated access negotiation skills and workshops to ensure um, the quality of their work. The next one is the national disability strategy. As you might know, the, one of the major pillars of UN Mass is uh, victim assistance and the mines and explosive victims in Afghanistan in order to ensure the social inclusion and well-being of um, this category of uh, people. Um, of UN Mass has um, hired um, specialist uh, inclusion and access specialists in order to work with the related national authorities and government of Afghanistan to develop a new national disability strategy. Uh, and currently it's under process of finalizing. And one of the last examples I want to mention is the gender mainstreaming. One of the major uh, priorities of UN Mass in Afghanistan is to enhance the gender equality in mine action of um, program of Afghanistan. And one of the most uh, recent activities that we had is was providing a national gender focal points for all the local uh, implementing partners and local organizations in mine action sector of Afghanistan and train them in order to enhance the gender equality in the, the, this sector. And uh, now I want to focus on the, um, one of the best or the most significant achievements of a mine action program of Afghanistan, which is having the first uh, female deminers in the history of Afghanistan. Um, I, I need to mention that uh, this project of uh, recruiting female deminers started in 2018. Uh, about 18 women from Bamiyan province of Afghanistan was recruited, trained um, to become deminers. And out of them, 14 of them were actually started their work uh, through a project implemented by the Danish demining group in 20 uh, in 2018 as a result of this project uh, more than uh, 55,000 square meters was cleared from the landmines in Bamiyan which was a big achievement in the history of Afghanistan after that project um, in 2019 the second stage of clearance started in which 16 female miners started working in this project of clearing ha three hazardous areas, which comprise the 139,000 square meters of the minefields and 314,000 of battlefields in Bamiyan. It was released through a clearance and uh, survey. And to give you more updates about the, the female deminers of Afghanistan, Currently, um, a so several of them are working on, and this project started in 2020, and currently is still it is going on in, in 2021. Now, uh, let me get your attention on, on a recent person 21 uh, uh, which is on the Afghanistan female 
the Miners Perception Study. It is a joint work of uh, GICHD, Danish Refugee Council, Danish Demining Group, DMAC, and also UNMAS. This perception study uh, was based on the quantitative questions uh, from baseline, which was before or at the start of the 2019 clearance project that I mentioned, and the end line, which was at the end of the project in 2019. And in this uh, research, the average of respondents was from both baseline and end line was 92 respondents. And we selected, or the sample of respondents was very specific. It was the female deminers themselves, the male um, team members of the female deminers who worked with the female deminers, the family members of the female deminers, and the community members who live in neighborhood of the female deminers in the Bamiyan. I need to mention all the um, all our respondents because our focus was in the Bamiyan province, and all the respondents was from uh, or living in the Bamiyan and the districts around it. This perception study um, it focused on three um, themes and uh, three perceptions. The first one was the perception of female deminers and how they see themselves, how they feel, or what is their perception towards your own job. Second was the resource management in the family, uh, how it changed uh, their role in the family uh, from financially or other aspects, as well as the decision making or their uh, role and their situation in the, their local communities in the society. So we came up with very interesting findings and you can read the, ho the whole findings uh, in the perception study, which is available for public in the internet. However, here I'm going to uh, share with you very few of them. One of the major ones was that uh, um, after the project book, uh, that women have the strength and the ability to work as a deminer. And uh, comparing to the start of the project, um, there was an increase in the confidence of the ability of women working as deminer. On the other hand, there was a decrease in the belief among female deminers that demining is not a dangerous job from 40% into the 14 person in the end line. So in other words, before the projects, the female deminers were thinking that it's not really a dangerous job. But after experiencing it, majority of them believe that uh, demining is a dangerous job for a woman. And the other trend that we find out was that comparing to men, more women were concerned about this job and more women were thinking that demining is a dangerous job for uh, women comparing to the men's perspective. The next finding that I would like to uh, mention is that among the family members of the female deminers that were interviewed, 100% uh, of them believe that women are able to be deminers. They are strong enough to be deminers. Comparing to the before or the baseline survey before the project, which was among men, there was 78%, and the female family members, 67% before the start of projects. So here you can see an increase in the belief and confidence of the family members and relatives about the capacity of women working in male-dominated um, jobs and male-dominated working area. 
And uh, the next finding is that about the efficiency or work productivity of the female deminers. The percentage of men who strongly agreed that female deminers are less efficient than the male colleagues dropped from 13% to 0% by end of the project. This is a very interesting finding. So in other words, I can say before the project, men were thinking that having female colleagues as the minor is going to be a trouble for them, or it's not as efficient as having male the minor. However, after accomplishment of objective has changed and they realized that um, women can be as productive as uh, men in the demining field. Uh, I need to mention that uh, prior to this study, the uh, Danish demining group has also have an, have a study about the productivity rate, and they also realized uh, that they are no different than the male deminers in the field, which is a very interesting finding. So, if you are interested to read more about this study, um, you can um, search it in the Google or find it in a UN mass website. I think it has been published in the websites of our other partners who has a part in this study. I need to mention, although we have that and very specified, and uh, some of the findings might need for far too research for your nurse disagreed or is strongly disagreed more than female colleagues that the mining is too dangerous for a woman by end of the project or why women were thinking that the mining is more dangerous comparing to men and another why female community members who either agreed or strongly disagreed that the mining is not appropriate for women increased during the data collection. So there are some questions and some trends that we found that and need, there is a need for further research and the further studies uh, for this topic. So this was all from me. If you have um, a question, um, please do not hesitate to ask in the Q and, um, QA section. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sahila. That's a very, very uh, thorough overview. Uh, we'll go straight on to, to Daniel. So Daniel, go ahead. Thanks very much, Matt. And good afternoon to everyone. I'll just bring up my uh, uh, presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor for, for myself and for DRC to be included on this panel. Um, it's, uh, it's a real honor for, for us and uh, I'll move ahead from the NGO perspective. I think the, the other panelists have really uh, given a good overview of the situation, both uh, in the past, the current, and, and I can provide some of the, the, the implementation side of things as well. So uh, in terms of DRC, also known as the Danish Demining Group, we've, we've been on the ground in Afghanistan since 1999. Um, so we're in fact one of the younger operators. Uh, we conduct the full package of mine action activities, including survey, clearance, uh, risk education. And uh, generally we work on what uh, has been defined as pre-2001 legacy contamination. So as what, uh, what was mentioned, so that Soviet-Afghan war and uh, the 90s civil war contamination, so that's legacy factory-made mines. But we've also been clearing a lot of UXO post-2001. Up until this point, we haven't so much engaged on the, the abandoned improvised mine, uh, otherwise known as uh, victim-operated IEDs. But uh, I'll get onto that in a moment about what our position is on that. Um, 
were given uh, given the experience of the the program and the map more more generally uh, our our engagement and our program is uh, 99% Afghan led and uh, including the senior management and uh, basically we put a strong emphasis on uh, integration gender mainstreaming innovation quality partnerships and of course safety so that's our that's our approach and our strategic thinking uh, behind our, our role in Afghanistan as, a, as an international NGO. So some of our achievements uh, over the last 20 years, as uh, Ms. Sahila um, explained, there was the female demining project that we were, we were fortunate to implement and we're very proud of it. Um, a decade ago, I think a lot of people would have said that that was something that was highly unlikely to happen and we managed it and then followed it up with, with two further projects. So I think this really reflects a, a kind of broader trend in mine action sector and the greater involvement in, of women throughout the sector, including technical roles. And that's something that we're looking at continuing to develop going forward. Um, uh, specific to D DRC, but also with uh, other implementing partners, uh, we are um, very much engaged in taking forward and, uh, and some of the stuff we've done in the past is cross-sectoral humanitarian and development work. So that examples of that could be cash for work to facilitate usage of, of cleared land after it's been um, inactive for many years. It could be uh, risk education, uh, emergency distribution points that are close to, to areas of contamination and minefields. Um, it could also be uh, vocational training for the D-miners themselves so that they, after the land is cleared, that they can find uh, possible career opportunities or for the, the people working on the land so that they can best put that land into use. So we've delivered uh, in-house uh, animal husbandry training, vocational training, uh, English language training, for example, to D-miners. Uh, a whole broad package of, of different uh, interventions that really link and cut across the, the whole humanitarian and development uh, sector. So, um, as Mr. Shafiq re referenced, uh, mine action is often a prerequisite for, for other interventions. So, we, we really do take it in that direction. And our activities are driven by level of impact and the casualty rates. That's really what defines. Um, all mapper IPs uh, prioritization. Obviously, there's uh, many uh, thousands of meters squared remaining to be cleared, and it's important that that's prioritized in in a manner that's appropriate that that, that achieves the most impact um, over time. So, so we work closely with uh, both the DMAC and uh, the, the different authorities, as well as the, the, the communities in which we work. We recruit heavily from the local communities to ensure that um, we benefit from local knowledge and we, we develop strong relationships with them. And then um, on top of that, the local communities can, can prioritize the tasking situation in their own communities. So, um, for example, uh, if there's a water well that might need to be demined, then that, that can be demined first, and we can, uh, we can work on that basis. I mean, I think it, it's been really um, exciting and interesting for me to, to hear from the other speakers about the, the uniqueness of the mapper, and I think it really is a unique mine action program um, amongst other countries, um, uh, given, given the experience that's present in it, that a number of personnel ha have been working in it for 20, 15, 30, 25 years. And uh, there's a real sense of each organization having that uh, unique expertise and added value. And uh, there's some real meaningful um, cooperation and coordination taking place across the sector. It's often referenced as the, the map of family with the different INGOs and NGOs working very closely together across the country. So uh, going back to my point on uh, integrated programming, I think this is a pretty interesting example of, of a project we've been implementing as, as DRC-DEG. 
since late 2018. So basically the backstory of this is that uh, when we were delivering uh, mind risk education in the northern part of Afghanistan near the city of uh, Mazar Sharif, we discovered a, uh, a village where uh, the villagers, uh, owing to lack of uh, resources, but also building materials, had uh, built their houses using uh, BM-21 uh, rockets to basically reinforce the, the structure of the house. So, so rather than using steel girders or wooden beams, the villagers uh, um, were, were close to this, uh, this depot that had exploded in the mid nineties, kicking out, of the, kicking out all, all of these rockets. And they, they picked them up and, and built them into their houses um, as door and window lintels in ceilings and floors, reinforcement of walls. So I think that the challenge was when we went to the village, the villagers um, uh, quite rightly said, look, we're not gonna allow you to remove these rockets uh, and uh, damage our houses without some kind of uh, compensation or, or rebuilding the house. Um, and we couldn't remove the rockets safely without, without doing, without some kind of damage. So what we did was we found uh, two, two different, very uh, different sources of funding, one for the rocket removal, which went ahead, and one for the, the reconstruction. And uh, DRC did that in-house uh, with some uh, expertise in terms of civil engineering and, and cash grants expertise to ensure that the work was done to, uh, in line with the expectations of the villagers, but was also safe, and then, uh, then remove the rockets um, the, the project's continuing to go on as over time more and more villagers have come forward in different parts of the in different parts of the district as well and uh, we're expecting over a thousand rockets to be removed and over a hundred uh, houses to re to be rebuilt but I think uh, basically the, the 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 kind of case study demonstrates that uh, mine action has a broad range of, of of involvement in different humanitarian interventions and it doesn't necessarily fit the, the classic image of a, of a D minor um, in a field. So uh, there's a lot of linkages that we, we need to, uh, to make happen. And um, it's, a, it's an opportunity and a trend that's been going on in the last uh, 10 or so years, not only in Afghanistan, but across the sector. So some of the trends and opportunities um, Going forward, we're going to continue to look at integration with other sectors. There are obviously a lot of competing needs, not only in Afghanistan, but across the sector, uh, across other countries where mine action is taking place and linking them makes, uh, makes perfect sense. The key challenge uh, currently in Afghanistan is humanitarian, uh, is humanitarian access, as uh, some of the other panelists mentioned. It's, uh, you can kind of break that down into, into two different ways. Access, uh, as, access denial, basically through active conflict, where the risk is uh, unacceptable for, for myself and my colleagues to, to work in. Um, and then also access denial through uh, armed opposition groups demanding taxation or registration in a kind of uh, quasi-state manner that uh, the NGOs and INGOs simply can't comply with. So I think linked to, link to what uh, Mr. Shafiq was saying, one of the kind of um, key things on the humanitarian community's radar is these negotiations taking place in Doha and also in um, Moscow and Istanbul with the Taliban and that the outcome of those will, uh, ev everyone is obviously watching very closely and will likely have a significant uh, impact on the way that uh, um, uh, operations, mine action operations, but generally the humanitarian uh, community um, works going forward. I think it's interesting to note that uh, 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 all IPs work throughout the, the Taliban regime um, from 96 to 2001, including DRC, who obtained their, their initial registration during that time. So whatever the outcome, we'll be here to deliver and to continue to clear. Um, and mine action is a little bit more insulated. Uh, 
due to uh, a perceived level of neutrality. Uh, of course, as an organization, uh, DRC and other NGO uh, working, NGOs working in the community are committed to the humanitarian principles, including neutrality and humanita humanitarian hum humanity, independence and impartiality. But uh, there will be there will be opportunities going forward for um, for different actors and uh, including a possible involvement of mine action in, in, in DDR processes that might come down along the line and also uh, abandon improvised mine clearance engagement uh, resulting from the, the peace in certain areas. Uh, that's it from me, so thank you very much once again for the opportunity. I pass it back to Matt. Thank you so much for another excellent and fascinating presentation. Um, it's been very, very rich and very interesting. And I'm going to abuse the privilege of chairing by asking two questions and then opening up for other comments. Uh, and I want to take advantage of the fact that we do have a, a long history here and a kind of historical perspective can be adopted. Uh, the questions are, are slightly different and I invite anyone to, to perhaps address them. The, the first goes back to uh, something you mentioned, Shafiq. I, I am very interested in the, the points you made about technological developments. I mean, technology can be an enemy, technology can be a friend. And listening to you, particularly when you talked about the major concern now being improvised explosive devices, I assume that technology has moved on this front and may have made things more challenging and more difficult for you. On the other hand, there are new technologies, which I said, uh, which you mentioned there wasn't enough funding for. I mean, do you, what kind of developments do you see going forward here? Can, can technological developments uh, 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 make, you know, facilitate make your job easier or are the trends such that it's making it difficult? As you know, in other aspects of warfare now, there is much focus on drones, for example, which introduces a whole new dimension to warfare. And I'm curious what you think of the, how the technology has moved over time. Uh, Martin might also, and Daniel, of course, might also have views on that. The other question is perhaps very difficult to answer. It's in the nature of the question, I suppose. And that really has to do with the, what you might call the advocacy side of your work and particularly your efforts to monitor the status of treaty implementation. And what I'm curious about is whether you uh, can in any way assess the significance and importance of the Ottawa Treaty for the kind of work that you are doing. I mean, that treaty has many aspects to it, one of which, of course, is production and transfer of anti-personnel mines. I think you mentioned that improvised explosive devices come in under the treaty, but I'm curious whether the, the significance of the treaty is mostly to be felt at what you might call the normative side of it, that there's an understanding that anti-personnel mines is illegal and shouldn't be used, or whether you've also seen another effect uh, of the Ottawa Treaty. Uh, that is a difficult, like all international treaties, it's a very difficult question to, to answer, but I'm curious what your sense on the ground is of the significance of that treaty. I don't know who wants to start, um, um, whether Martin or, or, or Shafiq or wanted to comment on either one of those two questions. Well, I, I think we, we want to hear from Shafiq a, a very brief word on technology, because I'm absolutely not up to date with the most modern technology. But just to say that when we were um, starting the program, all kinds of people would come up with fantastic ideas about wonderful technologies which were going to solve our problems like um, massively powerful water hoses until we pointed out that shortages of water and electricity might make these a little impractical. So we were more frequently presented with technology which wasn't going to work than with a technology that did. On the, on the treaty, uh, I, I do think that the treaty has had a phenomenal impact on the understanding about landmines. Um, some of you may yesterday have been listening to Heidi Kuhn from Roots of Peace 
in another King's College uh, webinar, uh, who was inspired to generate um, support from California wine makers uh, by the passage of the Ottawa Treaty in 1997. Um, my, my one doubt about the uh, about the Ottawa Treaty has always been Article 5, uh, which requires all areas to be cleared, because it has always seemed to me that governments should be able to decide that some areas um, there simply isn't a benefit to, to, to clearing them uh, because it'll be more costly and dangerous to clear them than to leave them marked uh, and so on. But I always lost this argument when having it with the lawyers and maybe they were right and, and, and I was wrong. But I do think that the, um, the, the obligation to clear every single uh, landmine is, is, is onerous and in some countries may not be practical. Thanks. Thank you very much. Shafiq. Uh, Professor, as, uh, the first question was uh, more relevant to Afghanistan. Uh, I think uh, personally that in mine action sector, uh, in terms of technology, uh, we didn't progress very well, not only in case of Afghanistan, but globally. There are clear reasons for that. As far as I remember, working more than 24 four years uh, with the program, we have been using uh, three types of uh, demining tool, uh, mechanical, manual, and dock. So, uh, manual, they are using a metal detector. The survey currently is mainly relying on uh, information gathered from local people. Local people can be, uh, it can be quantitative, but maybe less qualitative because it is based on the level of information that informants or inter interviewees provide to survey teams for definition of, for defining the exact boundary of the hazardous areas, there is always lack of efficiency. Maybe in Afghanistan, we have spotted that and we are trying to identify some sort of solutions that can scan the ground. Technology can see 100 meters of the ground depth, but uh, there should be some sort of a scanning or aerial system that can scan and identify those areas where mines are existing. We sometimes operators are clearing big areas, but no mines or less number of mines are found here. So there is elements of cost and time. Both are very important. There are about 300 square kilometers contaminated by anti-vehicle mines and all areas are flatlands. It is a priority for us, but we cannot clear that until we, we, or we do not clear that until we identify a best survey solution and clearance solution for that. The victim operated IEDs, that is another challenge. It is very scattered. You can expect anywhere. So this is big mass. I mean, there are containers, there is uh, different types of stuff that uh, non-state non actors use. So it should be easy to identify a solution for that to better uh, make use of them. This is my understanding. I agree with uh, Mr. Martin Barber. Uh, the convention has a very big impact uh, because many countries, those who are in a position to donate or to fund uh, the low-income countries uh, like Afghanistan, some of them, they are already member of the convention. So they feel some sort of, uh, I mean, uh, responsibility to support other countries because there is a provision within the Ottawa Treaty, which is promoting the cooperation and assistance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Daniel, did you want to comment on any of that? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, 
I, I, I agree uh, to an extent that we're not really where we should be, perhaps, in terms of embracing technology. I think uh, we're a little bit behind the curve, uh, although that we have made significant process um, progress in terms of uh, efficiency and economy over the last uh, 20 or so years um, in terms of releasing land uh, more quickly and with greater certainty. Uh, a lot of the detectors we now use are, are far more advanced than we would have used uh, 20 or 30 years ago and, and much safer for the D-miner as well. Um, they're employing uh, ground penetrating radar to and also uh, looking at detectors that uh, can, det can detect uh, minimum metal mines as well. So the, there have been technological advances and I have seen use of drones in other in other programs in across across the world, um, but yeah, there's still some way to go. And, but but uh, in summary, there there have been significant gains in terms of uh, reducing the the dollar per square meter uh, in the last twenty years. I think it's uh, somewhere hovering around eighty cents a square meter, currently sixty cents a square meter, whereas. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, you might have been upwards of, of two or three dollars a square meter. So uh, there, there have been contributions in that sense from, from technology. Thank you very much. We have a, a question from uh, Enrique Garbino, and maybe you introduce yourself, Enrique, as well, with your own background. I think you have a connection to the Swedish uh, demining service. Um, hey, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Actually, I, I don't have a connection with the Swedish uh, uh, the mining center. Uh, my background is actually as a NEOD officer in the Brazilian army and also as a weapon contamination delegate with the RCRC in Ukraine. But currently I am a PhD student at the Swedish Defense University and that's the, the link with Sweden. I'm really interested in the nexus between mine action and, and DDR programs. It was mentioned by at least two, two of the panelists and, and thanks a lot for the great presentations and discussions. Really, really insightful. And uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on this on this nexus between mine action and DDR, uh, based on the on the experience in the early 2000s in, Af in Afghanistan with uh, with the ex uh, Mujahideen fighters, and also the prospects of, of the current peace process and, and if there's something uh, envisaged uh, renewal of this program somehow. As I see it, there are benefits and also some kind of a challenges to overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shafiq, do you want to start with that? Uh, if you allow me, yes, uh, very briefly. Um, so uh, as a measure of confidence building, uh, I think uh, mine action has played a role in terms of uh, peace and reintegration of ex-combatants during the disarmament, uh, demobilization and reintegration program, which we call the DR, uh, DDR. Uh, sometime 2002-2004, and there were many ex-combatants, uh, which they laid their weapons down. They were absorbed by uh, the mining organizations because uh, mine action is uh, not a very complicated uh, field. Uh, it needs uh, a couple of month training. So in terms of uh, prov provision of training and mobilization, it is easier. And it is also uh, a little bit uh, has similarity with uh, military. Uh, so those ex-combatants, they prefer to, uh, to come in terms of uh, reintegration into the society. They prefer to be within or to work with mine action compared to other uh, vocational training like uh, tailoring, like carpentry, something. So the experience has shown that uh, mine action was successful uh, training were provided for them during the training of the mining. There were some other vocational training also provided for them. If they finish with mine action sometime, then they can do their, their life um, with other uh, vocational um, experience they had. And we look forward to the result of peace negotiation. First, uh, there is about 30% of the contaminated areas about if we can say about um, about uh, 400 square kilometers areas, which have priorities but cannot be accessed because of insecurity, 
uh, at that time you can access DR and there uh, are lots of uh, Taliban that can be can be recruited by the mining organizations at that time by who Thank you very much. Um, can I uh, turn to Carolina? I think you had a question touches on the new on the on the question of neutrality. Are you able to unmute Carolina? Hi, yes, good afternoon. Sorry good afternoon. about my camera is not working. No problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a master's student from the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and my specialization is actually on uh, engaging with non state armed groups. And I'm Colombian, and also, given by the Colombian experience, I would like to know how is the engagement with the non state armed groups? Uh, to identify the areas uh, that need to be clear, or is it always through a governmental institution? Because probably it also contains quite a lot of negotiation and previous um, work uh, with non-state armed groups uh, before actually doing the mine action programs and putting them into execution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting question of how you engage with non-state armed group. Who wants to uh, to start? I suppose all of you may have views on that. Um, Daniel or Shafiq? <laughs> Just uh, very quickly, uh, then maybe Daniel, which is uh, actually they are implementing uh, the mining activities in Afghanistan. So uh, fortunately, uh, taking into consideration the new neutral nature of uh, humanitarian mine action in Afghanistan, they can access uh, uh, every places, uh, and if there isn't any life fighting ongoing, because the mine action has been working through different regimes uh, uh, during the Mujahideen, the, then the Taliban, now during the new administration. And there are cases where uh, the mining organizations are working, uh, but it is not under control of the government, uh, or it is uh, an area which is not known whether uh, it is controlled by government or anti-government elements, but the mining teams can go because they are neutral and they have a good fame, they have a good reputation. Secondly, um, there are some uh, some institutions like uh, Afghan uh, ban landmine campaign that they can sometimes negotiate with anti-government elements through, through communities and also direct uh, negotiation with them. Uh, United Nations, maybe UNMAS can comment on that. They also have a channel that can, uh, can get uh, access or uh, negotiate for, for clearance of those areas which are, which are located under the control of them. Daniel, did you want to add to that? You've been dealing with them in the, in the field. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, so, so this is quite a, a hot topic right now in Afghanistan, I think globally, um, about uh, working in non-state actor areas. So, but, but certainly when we conduct uh, in line with the humanitarian principles, we, we go where the, 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 we're driven by the casualty rates so, and the, the priority of an impact of those locations. So we don't, uh, as long as it's safe to go to those locations and the risk is acceptable, then we will go. In terms of gathering information, of course, we'll, we'll try and speak to, to all actors present in that area. We're not going to exclude uh, voices, but the, we do need to ensure our, our colleagues are safe. But as Mr. Shafiq uh, mentioned, uh, mine action in Afghanistan is, is well accepted. Uh, by all parties to the conflict. So really where it's possible to gain access, we, we, we definitely will work and we, we will ensure that we speak to everyone as well. So, um, it, it, but the, the, the central database does lie with the, uh, with the DMAC and uh, information that we gather is then uh, uh, reported uh, and uh, compiled by the DMAC as well. So, we, we gather that information from the field and then pass it to the DMAC for, for tasking the operators. Yeah. Thank you very much. I wonder whether if either Martin or, or Sohaila want to add anything to the 
sorry, uh, um, Mats, we have uh, Mohamed Vakil. Okay. Who's, uh, who's the deputy director uh, of the UNMOS and let me, uh, yeah, I think you're on mute, Mohamed uh, Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, Yulia and everyone. So it is uh, an interesting uh, question. Uh, I would like to add that uh, Afghanistan has uh, a 10 years operation plan based uh, on the Ottawa Treaty. That plan covers all Afghanistan, so there is no differences where the project uh, should be implemented. And that plan is uh, based uh, on a number of uh, criteria, uh, prioritized and uh, uh, provided uh, the direction for the NGOs to implement project. Uh, I just give uh, an example, uh, uh, 2019 to the, to, uh, and to, to, uh, 2020, um, we implemented a project. It was mainly actually in the Taliban areas, but uh, partly on the uh, government control areas. So as I stated earlier, the Mine Action Program of Afghanistan is maintaining the humanitarian principles, which helped us to to run that project quite uh, successfully, establish uh, uh, committees uh, from uh, the areas under the government control, uh, establish people or committees uh, from the communities uh, under the Taliban. So they, that become like a confidence building measure between different uh, parties. It was a big project over uh, 500 D miners, and it was uh, successfully um, implemented. As stated by Shafiq earlier, the mine action in Afghanistan is uh, implemented by NGOs. And these NGOs, as it is very clear that they are non-governmental organizations and they work in different regimes uh, in the past 30 years. So they are very well known and uh, uh, well respected and they are uh, following the still the humanitarian principle which is uh, I could say a success for uh, them to run project uh, in different uh, parts of uh, the countries. Over. Um, that's maybe I could just add a, a brief um, historical note to that. Uh, when the program began in 1989-90, uh, the UN office coordinating the UN's action uh, negotiated what was known as the humanitarian consensus. And this was an understanding with both the, the then pro-Soviet um, government in Kabul um, and with all the different Mujahideen parties uh, based mainly in Peshawar and, and, and Quetta. And this was that the activities that were defined within the humanitarian program could be undertaken everywhere where the need was established according to the greatest need. Um, and um, that they would facilitate travel between the various areas and the activities that would be required. And one of the most important elements of that discussion was to get everybody's, all the parties agreement that uh, mine risk education and mine clearance and minefield survey should be included as part of the humanitarian program of the understanding of what was included within the humanitarian program. And at that time, I think we all felt that was, that was a bit of a breakthrough, uh, but it's, it's been tremendously important, not only in Afghanistan, but in many other countries around the world, that this understanding that humanitarian mine action is part of a set of humanitarian programs which should be um, encouraged and supported by all parties to a conflict, 
that this this has been maintained. Just just to add, sorry if uh, time allows. So if there are issues um, and areas under the control of the Taliban, normally uh, en masse uh, through Yunama and uh, Ocha, who has uh, regular um, uh, contacts uh, with Taliban, for example, in Doha, the issues uh, has been discussed uh, if it's relevant to the mine action. If there are, uh, uh, we had few uh, the, the miners uh, kidnapped by Taliban, uh, and then uh, through those uh, channels uh, of UN, those issues uh, were discussed, and uh, it, it uh, resulted in releasing of the deminers and releasing the uh, equipment uh, of the demining uh, personnel. So that setup is uh, quite uh, working well so far um, uh, through UN um, dealing with the. Uh, non state or group specifically Taliban. Over. Thank you very much. Um, Celine, you had a question. Celine Cheng. Yes, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Celine. I'm the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Specialist working for Humanity and Inclusion. I had a very operational question actually related to the case study that was presented by Danish Refugee Council um, about the homes, about clearing the homes that were constructed in part by um, ARW. Um, we're always looking for ways to link mine action with other sectors such as uh, cash transfer, for example, so I was wondering if there were any publications uh, linked to lessons learned and best practices from this project, as well as whether any kind of consideration was given um, in the perspective of the do no harm approach. So for example, by giving cash transfers to those who had constructed using explosive remnants of war, war was there any fear about encouraging um, unsafe behavior in other areas or communities? Thank you. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, so um, go ahead. Go ahead. Really, thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, I think uh, the project is still ongoing. We've cleared about uh, 30 or 40 out of the, the 100 or so houses um, that, that have this uh, that have this issue. It, it is a concern for us. I think it's very specific and uh, very uh, unusual in it's 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 not necessarily we haven't found any link with the uh, encouraging uh, risky behavior in fact our kind of clearance and rebuilding of their houses have, have encouraged um, uh, other community members to come forward who were previously reluctant about uh, telling us about this issue uh, for fear of uh, of having their, their their homes destroyed or 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 some kind of consequence, but it but it certainly would be an, a very interesting study to uh, to, uh, to to look at that more closely and to to bring our risk education and our, our monitoring and evaluation teams in to 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 make that connection and see if it exists between uh, cash transfers and and uh, encouraging unsafe behaviour as a result. Uh, Adawind, uh, we are approaching, I'm afraid, at the end, but we have a, have a little bit of time left. Uh, Adawind, do you have a, your question, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Matt, and uh, thank you to all panelists. Uh, I base my question based on my experience with Indian Army because I served there for 11 years. And uh, the question I put was using the capability of armed forces towards this demining ops. Because uh, all through my career, whenever the question of Afghanistan keep coming to us, like uh, like due to the geopolitics, India was not keen on giving some kind of offensive capabilities or stuff, to, uh, things like that to Afghan National Defense Forces. But when you look at demining ops, it has got a different perception towards as a humanitarian role. And if you ask uh, donor countries to send a huge uh, hundreds or thousands of peacekeepers, they may not be able to do but they can send small cohorts of uh, D miners who can be uh, used to uh, build the capability of the uh, Afghanistan or any other conflict affected country. 
and 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 also they have the expertise and uh, different countries depending upon their economy and their relevance of their uh, military policy they have a huge capability technology and things like that so would any of the panelists can tell me uh, like how it can it can be done is it possible or like it's yeah thank you thank you very much very interesting question there on tapping into that expertise i don't know who wants to 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 respond to that um so Haila as well i'm conscious you may want to come in on some of these questions but uh, shafiq and perhaps martin as well um and indeed daniel i don't know who wants to start do you want to go ahead uh, yeah, go ahead shafiq go ahead shafiq yes so um, can, you, can you please uh, repeat uh, the question uh, again i i didn't get the last point uh, do, do you do you say but how is the, what is the role of uh, troop contributing nations to Afghanistan in terms of capacity development, something like that? Uh, no, because um, my question was uh, to be specific. Uh, the, the contributing troops for peacekeeping roles has got its own dynamics of geopolitics. But here, the demining operations should be looked uh, from a humanitarian role because it's not only affecting the combatants or non-state actors, but it is widely affecting the common people and their livestock and source of their livelihood. So a country which can have a different uh, geopolitical interest, per se, like in Afghanistan, uh, can very well contribute to demining ops because it is a humanitarian. I see it as a humanitarian role. So, and, and armed forces, they have uh, huge expertise. Uh, so. Is it feasible to uh, tap it into their expertise and things in, in this parlance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I got the point. So uh, the uh, troop contributing nations, uh, they have uh, provided lots of support financially and also in terms of uh, capacity development of humanitarian demining. In addition to that, uh, countries which uh, they have sent their troops to Afghanistan, uh, they have uh, trained uh, some people uh, within the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of uh, Interior, specifically in terms of clearing landmines and IEDs in different parts of the country. And they had uh, schools in Afghanistan, which continually providing such a training. Uh, in terms of equipment and finance, uh, they also provided assistance uh, to uh, humanitarian mine action, MAPA, organizations like DDG, DRC, uh, and other, other organizations. Uh, some of that money has been, has been used for uh, capacity development. But one thing that should be noted, the military people cannot provide direct training to uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian demanding organizations in order to avoid, uh, avoid any harm to the neutrality of those organizations. But the armanis or the armani which they provide, uh, it is being used for training of uh, uh, organizations. I hope uh, I, I, I was able to answer the question. Martin, you want to add to that? Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, just to reinforce what, uh, what Shafiq just said. Um, when I was in charge of the UN Mine Action Service in New York, covering of the, the, the global operations of of UNMAS. Um, this was a very sensitive and important issue. Uh, and we constantly um, um, supported the, the, this, the, the distinction between support for humanitarian mine action programs and the activities of peacekeepers. Uh, even if uh, as UNMAS, we worked with both. Um, so it's re really important to, to, to maintain that distinction. And I think it's also important to see each operation in its very specific context, because an activity that might be understood as benefiting one party to the conflict in one situation might not have the same implication in another situation. So I think it's, it's really important 
um, in when considering uh, ideas like this to, to consider the context. And also perhaps one other point, um, the, the, the demining program, the mine action program in Afghanistan has developed um, an understanding about its own context and the kinds of, uh, of activities that, that, that can be beneficial, um, which is much greater than that of uh, so-called experts coming in from other countries very often. Uh, and, and I think, and this doesn't just simply apply to Afghanistan, of course. Sometimes the people who learn most from the uh, advice of the international experts can be the international experts uh, because they are learning a lot from the lo local team miners who have worked out what the best techniques are in their situation. Thank you very much for that, uh, that, that Martin. It was a very good point. Uh, we have a, a final question, I think. Um, uh, Yulia. Yeah, I just wanted to come. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. And I, I just wanted to come with one question to Suhaila. Um, I've been in Afghanistan in 2018 and probably communication with female deminers is one of the most inspiring things I've ever experienced. And uh, what is your experience as an Afghan woman? Tell us like just a briefly concluding remark, uh, working in a very male, still traditionally male dominated uh, humanitarian mine action. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Leo, for the, for the questions. Uh, well, I have been working uh, at the UN Mass, or uh, my first experience being in this sector is from UN Mass. And um, I personally have been in contact and interviewed the female deminers uh, many times. And they are very, very strong personalities, very strong women and with a great love to their country. So I believe if a man decides to work as a deminer, it really means that they really want to see their um, homeland safe from the mines. So one of the major things that I noticed in them or many other, uh, for example, we have a big portion of female risk education officers they, they also have a very challenging job to go to the communities and provide and deliver risk education uh, messages. And uh, my experience is that women are not given very easy jobs. It's challenging jobs to be a woman and um, to work in mine action sector. But despite of that, um, all the opportunities and responsibilities given to women in mine action, it has been a success. It has not been any failure. And as the study also showed uh, that the productivity rate of women working in this sector are no less than men. So personally, my impression is that uh, women are the crucial part of mine action in the success of mine action sector. Um, it's not um, nothing but um, a help and significant um, help and need for the women in mine action. And I hope in the future, uh, the rate of uh, female staff in MAPA increases as so far it has been uh, helpful for this program. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. I think, um... We have to bring uh, proceedings uh, to an end. I think it's been an absolutely terrific um, uh, session. I, I keep thinking of one of the slides you had, Shafiq, of that family where all the children had suffered uh, directly from uh, the, this, the scourge of, of, of landmines. And I think that picture itself is, is testimony to the importance of the work that you're all doing. So I'm extremely grateful that you've taken time out to share your, your experiences with us, uh, Martin, Shafiq, Sahaila, and Daniel. And I also want to reiterate a special thanks again to, to Yulia for, for conceiving of this idea of this session and deciding to organizing. And perhaps this is something we should be doing every year, every beginning of April.
to mark the importance of this subject. So once again, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and, and I hope to be able to invite you back um, to do this again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Thanks thank you. Very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary, for moderating. Thank you, everyone. Very interesting.